Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Smug Mug Live. Wherever you are in the world today, thank you so much for spending some time with me here on the show. This is episode 68 and we are all about celebrating Polaroid Week on this show and my guest will be joining us very, very shortly. As always, Smug Mug Live is brought to you by Smug Mug and Flickr. So if you're looking for somewhere to showcase your images to the world and have an incredible photo website, store your images online, and have a really robust e-commerce solution, then check out everything we have to offer at smugmug.com. Or if you're looking to be part of an incredible photo community, a lot of what we'll talk about today, then please head over and check out everything we do at flickr.com. I see a lot of you in the chat window there pinging away already in my ear. Thank you so much for joining us today. Give yourself a shout out. Let us know what part of the world you're joining us from. And yeah, if you have any questions, then post them in that chat window. And yeah, if you want to get involved in some conversations in there, that would be great as well. A lot of your regulars here on the show, thank you so much for coming back for another episode. Some of you will be new to the show, brought in from hopefully the Polaroid community. So welcome to the show and we're delighted that you're joining us today and I hope you look forward to our conversation with the wonderful Laura Alice Watt. Hi Laura, how are you? Hello. Good to see I'm you. Good. Yes. Good thank you, you for joining me today. And you are Absolutely. in... A beautiful part of the world. <laughs> I really am. Yeah. <laughs> Although today it's looking a little less beautiful than usual. Yeah, well, um, I'm in the... northwest. So I was going to say, if Sorry. we look at the poster behind your head, we can maybe have a little guess yes. of where you are. If, uh, if my if my <laughs> Icelandic is good, I think that says you're in Iceland. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, it says uh, that's a very small region in Iceland, yeah. which I'm here to study. But I'm in the northwest corner of Iceland. But as originally... far north and west as you can get in a town. Yeah. Originally from the States, whereabouts in the U.S. are you from? Yeah, I'm from Northern California. I've been living in Sonoma County for the last over 15 years or so. Very good. And you're on a bit of a sabbatical at the moment in Iceland, right? Yes, I'm, I'm on sabbatical from Sonoma State University, where I work, um, here on a Fulbright grant to do um, environmental history research of the Arunashrepa region, which is what that is. <laughs> ah, I see, because you are, um, you're Dr. Watt. Your I am Dr. Title, Watt. Dr. Laura As <laughs> Alice Watt. Uh, and you're a, you describe yourself as a geeky professor obsessed with photography, but your <laughs> profession is not photography. You don't uh, no. teach photography. What do you? What I do, don't. I teach do you environmental. About? <laughs> I profess. Um, I profess about environmental history. Um, cultural landscapes, environmental policy, um, restoration and preservation, all kinds of intersections of, of humans and nature, basically. Um, that's what I do. A jack of all trades, social scientist. Jack of all trades, social scientist. That sounds cool. I want to be one of those. <laughs> uh, let's have a look, little look in the chat window, see who's joining us today, and we'll say hello to some people. Scott is joining us from Illinois. Hi, Scott. Uh, Roy is joining us from the beautiful city of Bath here in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, hi from Germany, Any 7771 uh, Hi, Ina. It's Ina. Wish you were here, Ina. Uh, Wish but you were Good too. to see you in the chat window. Uh, John is joining us, a regular visitor from the Dog Pound, Alberta, Canada. Mm -hmm. He always gets a shout out to the Dog Pound. Hillary is joining us from Manchester, New UK. I'm also hey, Hillary. Hi, Hillary. I'm delighted that some of the, the my colleagues from the Flickr community team are here. Letitia's here. Many of you will know Letitia. Uh, and Carol's here, joining us from New York. Hi, Carol. It's great to see some colleagues in there. Rich is joining us from Florida. Sarah from St. Paul in... MN, Minnesota, is that? Minnesota. Yeah, see, my geography is getting better. Land um, of 10,000 lakes. There you go. And Jim joined us from Canyon Lake in California. So great number of folk in the chat window. As always, thank you so much for your uh, join, time and joining us today. It's always great to see you in there. And if at any point you have a question during today's show, then just start your question with the word question so that I can find it in there. Um, we said a hello to a few people in there that we know because uh, you're here representing the Roid Week Flickr group, uh, yes. which celebrates Polaroid Week. Uh, how long have you been involved with, with Roid Week? Um, I have been a participant in Roid Week since the second 
incarnation of it. It started in 2006 and I posted my first image in 2007 spring, I think. So long time. Long time. And you're one of the admins there along with Ina and some, some other members. That's a, good, right. a good team over there and a great community in that Flickr group. It is. It's, it's, uh, it's great to have fellow obsessed people who love to shoot instant film and all kinds of film, but instant film, especially. Yeah. And it is one of those genres of photography or techniques of photography that people can get quite passionate and obsessive about, right? <laughs> Just a little bit. I was, uh, I've been laughing because, you know, prices, especially of pack film, which is no longer being produced anywhere. Um, well, almost anywhere. Fuji used to make it, Polaroid used to make it, they don't make it anymore. So um, most of us have stashes in our refrigerators that are dwindling fast and there's not much to replace it with. And there's a, a discussion um, thread in Polaroid Week this week about, so what have you bought this week? <laughs> <laughs> all the people like I'm on eBay obsessively trying to get this pack film or whatever. I'm like, oh my god, people have a lot of money to spend on this stuff. Yeah, and, and, and big refrigerators <laughs> to keep it all in. I, I actually, I, I don't have Polaroid film in my refrigerator, but I do have um, one twenty roll film uh, in the in the the fridge that I'm keeping. I have quite a lot of that as well. People laugh at when they come over to my house and they open up the fridge and they're like, the entire first top shelf is filmed. Yeah, I'm just posting <laughs> a link to the to the group there. So there's a link to the group in the chat and also in the description here below the the, the live stream. Um, if you want to go check out uh, the, the Flickr group. Uh, in fact, we can showcase it here just now. So we're celebrating Polaroid Week 2021. But as you said, it started back in... 2006 was the the incarnation right. of the whole kind of celebration of it um and it's it's just one week a year is that right it's actually now two weeks the two first two. year it was only one right um spring two, and fall maybe spring and fall yeah we do one in um usually in april and one in october mm. great times of year to be uh to be doing photography and that's for sure yeah and it's it's funny it's six days instead of five um We've experimented over the years. It started off as five days, just the mm -hmm. weekdays, um, because the original co-founders, Kate Ratchford and Lori Baker Brown, wanted their weekends to do other things. Um, <laughs> Smart. They didn't want to be chained to their computer. Yeah. And I think there was at some point where we experimented with you doing the whole seven day week and it was just too long. People were exhausted by the end of it, yeah. just in terms of checking in and posting and blah, blah. So we settled on a, um, compromise of six days so it starts on a sunday and ends on friday yeah um so yeah it's almost the end of polaroid week but there's some incredible images in there which we'll have a little look at in the moment but, but before we get to the group a little bit more let's let's talk about yourself when did you start taking images uh not necessarily polaroid but when did you start your photography obsession uh, my first camera i was eight years old <laughs> <laughs> um both of my parents are very good amateur photographers. I think dad would enter, you know, he's very Ansel Adamsy in his style of photography and would enter in local competitions. And my mom, her slide collection is just enormous. I've really been enjoying um, actually scanning a lot of her slides as I've gotten older, trying to sort of compile some of our family history and so on. Um, but anyway, so they gave me an Insta Kodak Instamatic when I was eight. Um, and I was just thinking about that this morning, actually. It shot, I guess it was 110 film. I can't mm -hmm. remember. Yep. But anyway, it was they were square, little black and white square prints. Um, so maybe that's why Polaroid seems so natural to me, <laughs> and 120 film for that matter, that the square format just is where I started. I had never thought of that before. Um, I'm not sure I have any of those early prints anymore. There might be a couple in scrapbooks, but... Um, Photography is just something that my family did. Uh, my parents both took pictures all the time. And so I just fell into it and have also taken pictures all the time, made a lot of scrapbooks when I was in high school and stuff like that. Um, and then when digital photography came along, it just was like, oh, that, well, that's an interesting way to do things. Um, and 
I can't remember how I found the website Photolog back in the early 2000s when it was first sort of uh, the first photo sharing website that I encountered. Um, but it had this really cool sort of community of people. You could make friends and you could follow their, their photos and make little comments. And that was all very new and exciting. Um, and I was in grad school and had nothing better to do. So. Um, and then it, it then Photolog imploded. It got it was oddly got taken over by um, a whole bunch of Brazilian teenagers who were using it as a dating site, I think. Um, and it totally crashed. Way ahead of their time. Way ahead of their time. <laughs> they crashed it. It kept collapsing. It just couldn't yeah. handle the bandwidth. And so a bunch of us ended up um, over migrating Flickr. over to Flickr. So I joined Flickr in like fall of two thousand four, a long time ago. And when did the when did the love of instant film start? That came along actually in part because of um, well, it was entirely because of, of friends I knew through Flickr, including Kate and Laurie, the founders of Roid Week, because um, folks were starting to post these things, and I had inherited my dad's disdain for Polaroid. He was like I say, he was kind of Ansel Adamsy, and and he was like, oh, Polaroids are toy cameras; that they're not real photography. Um, and so I had never really thought about them much. And but then I was seeing these images that people were scanning and posting on Flickr and they were beautiful. This luminous light that you often get with with instant film that you just can't get with anything else. And um, I bought a, I think a Polaroid, uh, and now I can't remember which which brand model it was, but one of those sort of just point and shoot, no controls. Mm -hmm. And I it was an awkward camera. I didn't enjoy using it at all. Um, I did take a few good pictures with it, but you know, the flash would go off when I didn't want it to, and you couldn't make things lighter or darker. You just, it really was um, frustrating. And Kate and I had become friends. We both lived in San Francisco at the time. And so um, we were hanging out and she was like, well, you should have a Spectra. They're cheap and they're great. So she just bought me one. They were like $20 at the time. It was still very generous of her. And she was like, here, take this. Um, so she, she started the all. beginning your, of the rabbit hole. It's all your, her fault. Your gateway drug was that cheap <laughs> yeah. Spectra. Yeah, exactly. So we'll, bl we'll blame Laura for that, uh, Kate for that. Um, yep. The uh, It's interesting. My, my world, my use of Polaroid, my world, I shot, social photography for most of my career before joining smug mug and you know weddings portraits that type of mm. stuff and you know i had the the polaroid back on the my hasselblad 500 and it was always something that just got used to check exposure and then it was thrown away yeah. right and it wasn't until long after i'd stopped using it that people introduced me to you know the artistic side of polaroid where I had no idea there was so much more you could do with it, not just in the the art of taking it and the you know the skill of of you know making uh, the chemistry work the way you maybe wanted it to or not you know work in strange ways that you weren't expecting, <laughs> but also people like peeling them apart and doing stuff with the emulsion layers and all that type of stuff. It's just yeah. a fascinating world. There, there is a lot of um, of incredible creativity that. Um, I am one of, I think, the least uh, creative Polaroid shooters that I know. Uh, most of my pictures are just straight photos. You know, that I'll if I get really wild, I'll include in the scan the the goopy frame around an image yeah. instead of just the image. Um, but yeah, there are folks doing emulsion lifts and sewing onto the, you know, putting embroidery thread in the Polaroid or um, using crazy filters, doing a lot of double exposures. There's just mm -hmm. some really cool stuff you can do with it. It's an interesting world. So what I want to do now is pop over to your Flickr account. Uh, and you've kindly put together a little uh, little album <laughs> for us today uh, to look at some of your images. Oh, that's uh, uh -oh. what happened there. Demo gods. That's there we go. That. There we go. <laughs> so... Uh, the, this uh, rather unexciting photo is my yeah. first Polaroid I ever took. First one you ever took. That's very With the crummy camera, whatever kind it was. Um, that's in the parking lot at Sonoma State where I always parked my car <laughs> for 15 years. 
just trying to figure out how this thing worked um, or didn't work as the case may be. So the but, very first you know, one you took? Very first one. Is that with um, the, the then, Spectra? No, this was with the one step. I can't remember what it's called. Yeah. Um, if you scroll down, actually, you can see yeah. nope. uh, somewhere down there. It's in a set. One six hundred. That's what it is. One six hundred ultra. Mm -hmm. right. um, so I use that for a little while. And um, and actually, if you go to the next picture in that mm -hmm. set. That's Kate. Yay. Not taken with the one six hundred, but taken with an SLR six eighty, which was <laughs> the camera I got after she gave me the spectra. Um, but so just to give her her and Lori credit for starting this whole wonderful thing of called give her Roy her, her fifteen seconds of fame. But exactly. Make sure that you took over. <laughs> you enjoy that. Um, <laughs> yay. And then the next one is, I think this was my first posting in the first Polaroid week that I participated in that spring 2007 one. It was a picture of the lemon trees at my house. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it just, I, I was already starting to figure out, oh, wow, it just does, I don't know, something about the light and the colors is different than, certainly different than digital and even different than regular film, film, yeah. film. Um, that just somehow makes things look nicer. <laughs> so, so that was with my Spectra. Spectra, you know, sadly the the Spectra film isn't being made anymore either. Uh, although it's not entirely clear to me why the last few packs I tried to use didn't work at all. They right. just were dead. Um, but back when it worked, it I this is one of my favorites that I've taken. Just somehow the light. This was at my house in in Sonoma County and. The light and the dark turned out really well. Yeah, beautiful balance of tones in that image, which uh, I've I've often found, you know, it's probably due to my lack of experience, you know, mm -hmm. controlling the you know the amount of light, the amount of contrast with with Polaroid and instant film in general. I've always found a little bit tricky in uh, in sunlight, you know, in, in outdoor situations. Um, but yeah, it can be, know. it can be hard to know how it's going to react. I actually just took a couple of pictures yesterday here, um, down by the, um, shore and it's a, it's gray and overcast. And I thought it would do something really sort of luminous and pretty. And they just turned out really flat dull. So, oh, well. Yeah. Money down so, the drain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because this, you know, this isn't digital. This is costing costing us money every time we press a button. Back, exactly, but you know. it's worth trying. Um, it's a very and then interesting was, shot. This was a place I was renting actually. Um, when in 2010, after Polaroid, the company, the original company Polaroid, announced um, bankruptcy, and yep. um, they said they were no longer going to be producing film. And as I understand it, they had some, I think they had seven different production facilities around the world and they were not only closing them down, they were smashing all the mechanisms that made the film. Because of course, Polaroid films, whether it's pack film or the, the self-developing kind is just layers and layers and layers of film and weird chemicals and that have to be, you know, orchestrated in some yeah. very technical way. And I, I still don't understand why they were just like, let's, you know. So, uh, so that, yeah, <laughs> this, was, um, this is when they were going bankrupt. And I think their last, their last factory was in the Netherlands. Um, that's right. right. And okay. there was a group, I think made up of a, a number of people who are very passionate about Polaroid film and also some former employees mm -hmm. um, who were really sad to see this going. And they were like, please don't destroy the last one. Let us buy it from you. Mm -hmm. And then they had to try and re-engineer the chemistry of making Polaroid film. They had the machines at least. There's no machines left to make the the pack film, peel apart film that was all destroyed. Yeah. Um, but there was this one left that made the self-developing film. So um, that image that with that little house was, um, I was one of, I think about 40 people who were asked to test the first batches of the impossible project, perfectly named yeah. group. Um, their first batches of film that were that they felt good enough about to actually share with anyone. They sent us each, I think, three or four packs of mm -hmm. trial film with numbers on them and said, shoot them however you want, whatever conditions, but just please keep track of what you're doing. 
you know, take a lot of notes and then you can scan and use the scans yourself, post them on Flickr or wherever, but then send us the originals back so we can study them and figure out see, how see this is all working. It. Yeah. So, that, so um, that was interesting. So the impossible project was that small team of some ex, ex employees of Polaroid, some really passionate people bought over that factory. I think, you know, even kind of rebuilt some of the machines that had been partly destroyed, uh, created the impossible project. And then, Many years later, and not that many years ago, they, I think they actually took back the Polaroid name. Is that right? I think they got the, yeah, the it was, IP I for don't, that. I don't, I, I don't know any of you know, the business dealings yeah. of whether it was some merger or a purchase or what. Um, it, was, it was a real undertaking for those who aren't as familiar with, with um, instant film because a lot of the, the chemicals that were used to make the original Polaroid film either were no longer in commercial production at, in sizes enough, large enough um, quantities to be sort of commercially viable and or they were too toxic to use under um, modern uh, regulations yeah. about toxicity and so on. And so they really had to quite literally reinvent the film, which is, I'm still amazed that it worked at all. Yeah. No, the name, <laughs> um, the name is possible. It's such a strange thing. <laughs> It was a well-named project. Yeah, and yeah. Polaroid film is such a weird thing anyway that it's like, oh, it develops all by itself while you're watching. Um, although you have to be very patient with newer stuff. The old stuff, you know, when I was a kid, Polaroids you developed in about a minute and yeah. now it's more like 40 minutes. But um, but there was a, 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 real, yet, a real interesting community and vibe around that whole Impossible project um, that really engaged with people over the last you know, decade, I guess. Um, yeah, it, and you know, it's, and it's, it's still going, even though now it's back to being called Polaroid, it's still the, the, the kind of the foundation was in that passion that, you know, the, the impossible project brought back to people who just love this genre. It's true. And, and honestly, I, Flickr wasn't the only place that things were happening, but it was, I'm sure, one of the more imp important conduits of that community. Um, both that we had things like Polaroid Week where we all sort of got together and, and we, we got to know each other through, you know, people from all over the world, like Ina and I, Ina feels like a friend we've never met. Um, we just shoot Polaroid film and we see each other's images all the time. And yeah. you do get to know people in a funny way when you see both what they're choosing to take pictures of, how they take pictures, those little glimpses of their life and the way they see the world. Um, it, it can be very instructive in a way. And so, and and just then too, we had, because of the way Flickr is set up with groups and threads and themes and so on that, you know, pre-Instagram, pre-Facebook, yep. this is really where a lot of that community was built originally and then really sort of helped to, you know, Impossible Project had, had a really easy, just sort of like, oh, here here are all the people who are obsessive about the product we're making, yep. um, or at least so a lot of them. Found, it, found their home amongst the, the community you were you had built here on Flickr. Um, and, you know, it's, it's gone from strength to strength. And you have had, over the years, you've had meetups within the community through Flickr and get-togethers and that type of stuff, yeah? Yeah, I remember went back when my it, my not computer friends thought it was very strange that I had friends who I had never met, <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, and I have met some of them, and it's really wonderful when you finally do meet up in person because you know whether it's through something I when I was living in San Francisco and and Oakland I would in the two thousands we had some Esfker meetups. SF Flickr, um, like once a month. We I, mean, I didn't go to all of them, but yep. I think they were happening once every month or once every two months or something. Um, and they were, you know, it was, it was like, oh, hey, and we would all bring our geeky cameras and talk about stuff. Um, I've also been in some critique groups um, and, or you know other kinds of community like that. And when you actually meet in person after years of knowing each other through photography stuff, it's really wonderful because people it just is. feel like really close friends yep. immediately, even though you'd never met in person before. Yeah, and it's not unique to the Polaroid group. We hear that from all no. our, our community that just, you know, find their, find their home in Flickr and, and, you know, 
love the opportunity to meet in person. Obviously, this year not been the easiest not year to so do much. that for sure. <laughs> um, it's funny. Uh, a few folk uh, see, giving some shout outs in here. Um, let's let's not ignore the people who are who are tuning in. So. Mauro says hello everybody. I know that Mauro Hi. lives in Slovenia. Thanks for joining us. Peter mm -hmm. Norby says, Hey Laura, good to see you after such a long hey, time. Hey Peter. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, and, I met Peter at those SF Flickr meetup days. Yeah, and that's ago. that's what he said. He said Flickr. Flickr. <laughs> <laughs> uh, funny. Estrella says, Hi everyone. Greetings from Bolivia. I'm glad to be oh, part of the Great Polaroid Week. Yay. We are Glad you're here. Peter Knight says hi, Laura. Hey, Peter. Gorgeous images this week. Yeah, and Ian Fleming says hi, folks. So there we go. And we've got some questions, but I'll, I'll come back to the questions near the end because, you know, we want to look at some imagery. And this next image is one of yours that you and I spoke about earlier because this is a really intriguing image that I really, mm. really love. And I, I'd said to you, it's, you know, I said, was this an, a, a late evening, nighttime shot? But... <laughs> This was uh, an interesting reason why this looks the way it does. Yeah, so this is at Mount Hood in Oregon. I had um, I had driven up for a conference in 2010 and decided to drive up the coast um, between Northern California and Oregon and then back down behind by the volcanoes. I wanted to avoid I-5 as much as possible, which between California and Oregon is actually challenging. So. Um, <laughs> But anyway, I, I it had just snowed the night before when our conference was ending. I dropped off a dear friend of mine at the airport and then drove up to Mount Hood. And I hadn't used pack film long enough to realize that the cold would affect its color. So um, this is taken in broad daylight. The people are a, um, a wilderness rescue group training with right. snow caves, building snow caves and figuring out how to get people in and out of them. Um, but the cold shifted everything blue and it just looked amazing. And this is part of that thing that is what, one of the things I really love about Polaroid film is it does strange things that you don't always expect. Um, and so I had no idea it would do this. It wasn't planned, but that element of serendipity is part of what I really enjoy. I remember here listening to a, um, a document or watching a documentary about Sally Mann years ago and her talking about her um, wet plate work and how she she described it as she wants the angel of uncertainty to come to her plate and I think that's part of what appeals to me at least about instant film as well is the the fact the way it feels like a collaboration between you and the film and the camera that's really interesting last week you and i were talking we were trying to come up with a title for this episode we, that's what we should have called it what was it the angel of uncertainty the angel of uncertainty that should have been a show title <laughs> right? i had forgotten about that until just now <laughs> that's that's a great a great way to see. a lot of great comments coming in about this image um oh thank you uh too many to maybe pull up but people loving the the tones and the colors of this image color color photography when you're developing color photography the hardest part of color photography is color is the temperature, right? Ca you know, calibrating the the temperature between all the, the you know the the chemicals that you need to use to the, to develop color film. So, being out in the cold with a you know an in, you know, an instant film, uh, and I guess <laughs> even being in uh, being in too hot a climate, it's going to do yeah. things that you just have no control over. Um, exactly, too too hot, too cold, too humid. It can all do strange stuff. Yeah. Um, and then too, I mean, one of the funny things about, and I, there are different people have different approaches to this, but one of the odd things about all film, not just Polaroid film is then of course, part of the process is scanning it. Um, and so that you can share it, you know, obviously you have the, the, the original image that's in your hand, that's yep. just, you know, this little thing, but then you have to sort of make this thing digital if you're going to share it online, obviously. So you could just take yep. a picture of it, but any, whether you're taking a photograph of it with your phone, yeah, I'm spilling them everywhere. Well, it's um, interesting. We have, or, we actually have a question about that. Uh, Rich asked, what's the best way to scan Polaroid film images for social media or even prints, or <laughs> of course, to get them in your Flickr group, uh, you need to yeah. digitize them. So what, what you, is, you know, these days people can just take a picture with their phone and that's almost, you know, at some level, especially for just kind of sharing on social media, that's probably as good as it needs to be. Um, but it's always also important to remember that any, 
any scanning device, sorry, just knocked the table, whether it's your phone or a fancy scanner, just behind my computer back over there, um, is that those are just cameras too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so they, you know, if whatever their calibration is, I, my scanners always seem to see um, Polaroid images, they always seem to shift them pink. Right. Um, compared to what I can see in my hand. And so I'm always having to try and shift them back. And some people are real purists and they're trying to get the scan to look exactly like the image in your hand um, because Polaroids are tangible objects. And so you're like, okay, we gotta get it to look exactly like this. Yeah. But you can also think that, well, when you may take a digital picture or if you take a picture with film, you know, Ansel Adams back in his dark room, he was not just making a straight print of his negatives. He was tweaking things. He was dodging and burning. He was, you know, doing little tricks of the hand to make the image stronger. And so I tend to treat Polaroids like negatives, that they're a piece of information, a visual information that um, I stay fairly true to, I, you know, I don't suddenly, you know, cut and paste a dinosaur and stick it in. Um, you could, I'm not really that good with Photoshop, <laughs> so I probably couldn't. Um, but, um, but I don't feel, I don't feel tethered to the exact thing that came out. So I shot, I don't have them nearby, but I shot a pack of blue, pack film recently that's very expired it's from god knows when 2000 and something um and um the images turned out pretty pale which i liked and they also they were shifted way purple i think because it's old and in my scans i was like yeah, i'm not a purple person purple is for just, many people they love it i'm just not you. one of those people so i shifted it back toward blue yeah. um because that's more what the film would have originally looked like and it just was more satisfying aesthetically to me yeah. so like i said there are purists there are people who do all kinds of crazy stuff and everything in between so there's no one right way okay. some great comments about that sarah rubens hi sarah thank you for answering it she answered rich, rich saying use a flatbed scanner epson perfection yep. v500 i don't know that it's the best but it's what I use, she says. Well, what's really interesting is it's also what I use. That's what's mm -hmm. behind me right here is a V500. I use it for uh, slide scanning, uh, but I always found the V500 was a good balance between uh, quality and the price. You can yeah. you can go a lot higher than a V500, but I think it's a pretty good price point for what it's able to do. And especially when you're scanning, you know, a fairly small, uh, yeah. you know, a Polaroid, you know, you don't need anything super crazy. So, but uh, yeah, your phone, it, I think the hardest thing with the phone is controlling reflections. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and that's the nice and thing the about And the texture flatbed. too. Mm. Yeah. So, and also cool. that's, I, I, I used to have a V500. I now have a V800 because that is what I have. Um, the other part that's interesting, if you're going to make prints is actually finding paper that works well with, the images um, because some like especially the peel apart Polaroids after they've been scanned and then you know I want to print them bigger they sometimes can look really weird like they're just kind of pasted onto the paper um, often because they themselves have a texture and that texture then shows up as part of the image so um, I did a lot of experimenting when I was when I was doing um, uh, you know, photo prints of the scans of Polaroids. I'm not doing that now because I'm in Iceland. I don't have a printer. So I have to make pa watercolor paintings instead so I can make something. Um, but uh, well, back when I was doing that, I, I experimented with a lot of different papers and some looked better with, you know, instant film. Some it had a little bit of glossiness. They kind of mirrored that glossy texture that the the self-developing Polaroids have. Others, um, especially, I did a whole um, a whole exhibit of, or a whole series of chocolate Polaroids that have a very strong sense of texture in the image itself. And those, it took me a long time to find a good paper, but then I finally did, and they look pretty good when they print it out, so. 
Some great comments. Uh, the, back to this image, Norby uh, says that's the true definition of colour temperature. Yeah, the temperature definitely affected <laughs> uh, the temperature. But it's such a beautiful... I, I just was really drawn to this image. Um, and as you see, it was not exactly what you planned, but then sometimes that's the best thing. An interesting comment here from, from Gary, who, who watches the show regularly. He says... Is it still mandatory for everyone who takes a Polaroid to wave it in the air to try? <laughs> yeah. But we still do. Especially the, those peel apart ones, is some of the film, like 669 film, mm -hmm. which is what took that Mount Hood picture, is really sticky for a really long time. So the biggest challenge when doing those is having something to hold them in so that they don't attract every particle of dust, dust and yeah. crap that's right in there. So I, I basically don't even use pack film if I'm not going to be just driving around in my car. Um, I know some people have you know constructed really cool little boxes to with little slots so you can keep them separate so they don't all stick together and let them dry while you're hiking. Um, there's a wonderful Polaroid shooter, um, uh, Bastian um, in Germany, who's incredibly gorgeous images using large format cameras often. Mm -hmm on you know these incredible mountain tops with himself in the picture you know like, how do you even do that and how do you get them back without them all sticking together yeah. but um i am is, not that dedicated the the large the large format polaroids is it still possible to get that film in large format as well i think so um yeah. there's still some you know just like with all the other pack films there's still some stash film that's been yeah. in refrigerators for a long time i have one box of type 55 in my refrigerator that i'm terrified to try and <laughs> use because i'm afraid i'll screw it up yeah. um and the polaroid was making eight by ten film instant film for a while i think it's not available right now but i think there's some hope it'll come back Sorry, Sarah says no waving in the air, but sticking it in my armpit though. Yes, I, I still. <laughs> my daughter has a Instax uh, SQ camera, which we we have a lot of fun taking Instax. And with Instax, you don't have to do anything. But I still find myself while we're doing something else, sticking it in my armpit. It's it's. It's, just a, <laughs> it's a good way to thing. temperature regulate exactly. Yeah, yeah, especially in cold places like Iceland and Scotland, it's it's a good idea. Right, let's look at some more imagery because again, so you you have some beautiful stuff you've put in this album for us. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, reception. That was just taken on that same Oregon trip. Um, I think it was with the ATZ film that Polaroid made just before they went out of business. That was kind of a weird knockoff of time zero film um didn't always work great has a funny texture to it but um i really like this image and have actually used it then to make cyanotypes and mm. palladium prints from having scanned the polaroid it's so weird when you're you know taking an analog thing making it digital then turning it into a digital negative printing that out into an object and using it to make contact prints <laughs> yeah. but back and forth between negative between uh, digital and and analog Let's see what's next. Uh, okay, I'm glad this image was next because, again, yeah. looking at this image, you know, you and I spoke about this earlier. Uh, this one, looking through your images, this one just stands out as just an incredible image. And you mentioned that you weren't wow, even sure you. that, you know, this was a bit of a surprise to you when you saw what it had done to the film. Yeah, right? I had no idea the light would do that. And that's something that you would never get with a digital image or a, even probably with 120 film or something. It just wouldn't create that bizarre shaft of light. This is in an abandoned herring factory in um, in Ernestrepper, the place mm -hmm. in the map, um, that is made, you know, gigantic concrete building that's been unused except as a museum for part of it since the 1950s. Utterly freezing cold. <laughs> um, very low light. I think I had my camera on a tripod for this. I'm pretty sure I did. Um, but just wandering around taking pictures and boy, the light just did this magical thing. It looks like it should be a church, but it's an old herring factory. <laughs> yeah, it's the it's the angel we were talking about earlier. That's <laughs> right. It's the angel of uncertainty, which the angel you know, the, the that that serendipity is is like I said, it's what I love. I think the next one might be another serendipity story. Yeah, but just before um, we move off this one, you know, on a modern mm. on a modern digital camera, uh, or even on a, a you know a, a thirty five mil 
film camera, you never would have got this image. It would have been yeah. properly exposed. It would have, you know, exposed, you know, all the detail and on, you know, where you have this incredible piece of light. It's, it's just, you wouldn't have got this in anything other than yeah. Polaroid. Exactly. It's the, the, the camera is seeing something that I didn't see, or maybe that I had an inkling of because I obviously mm. decided to take this shot. Um, as opposed to turning the camera toward the bench and focusing on that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's those moments where it's like the camera and the film reveal something about the world that you couldn't see otherwise. That really feels why instant film is so special. Yeah. There's a lot of love for this one in the chat. <laughs> uh, a lot of people love it. Stunning. Yay. Norby says it's very Thank ethereal. You. Um, Sierra says it's a stunning image. Lisa, wow, big love for this one. Thank you. Uh, so, thanks, people. Uh, Estrella says it's fabulous. So yeah, uh, and I agree that that one just stood out so much. Incredible film image. That's I know one I think you just wouldn't get it elsewhere. You know. Yeah, and um, it's one that I I think I have made a print of it, but I'm kind of wishing I had brought fun to stick on my wall because it's one that has you know it, it's funny when when you, I, I take a lot of pictures I, I take pictures almost every day with my phone I'm just you know I'm I'm it's I'm compulsive about it it's like breathing I just can't not take pictures it's been part of my life for too long I guess um and a lot of them are just like oh that's okay you know oh, that's nice that just sort of you know it's storytelling maybe through imagery I, I definitely um do a lot of that in a way mm -hmm. But there's some that just stick with you for years, and yeah. this is one of mine. <laughs> well, all, all of you who are in there showing your love for that in the chat here on the live stream, get over to Flickr to, to Laura's site and get in the, in the conversation <laughs> here under this image. Give it a fave and get your, your comments underneath this image uh, and show it some uh -huh. love over there on Flickr. Uh, now, the next one you said. This one is, again, um, I. this is a rock on the side of the road in Arne Schrepper in the Strandier that um, I was on a photography group trip um, led by Bill Schwab. If you're interested in going to Iceland and taking photographs, look up Bill Schwab's website and get on his workshops because that's how I fell in love with Iceland. Um, and anyway, we kept driving past this on our way to go do different stuff. And I was just like, that, that's so cool. There's this tuft of vegetation. It looks like a sculpture but it's just the natural way the grasses grow on top of this huge rock. Um, and I wanted to photograph it. I mean, every time we drove past, I was like, man, we got to stop one of these days. I can take a picture of that thing. And we finally did. And you know, I took some, I think I'm sure I took film. I took iPhone pictures and I took this Polaroid. And this was one where I was just so happy with those little magical lights. You know, I don't know why the chemistry makes those little gold things or the weird streaky things in the sky, which 669 is notorious for. Yeah. But it just adds to the image so much. And the coolest part was that, you know, I, I remember I peeled it and I was like, oh, this is so perfect, I'm so excited. <laughs> um, and uh, then later I found out, I think I had posted an image of this on Facebook and I was friends with a woman who lives in this in this very remote area. This part of Iceland, it, it, the municipality, which is the equivalent of a county in, in the US, is the smallest one population-wise in all of Iceland. The summertime population is officially registered as about 40 people. Um, so <laughs> there's really not very many people there. Um, anyway, one of the people who is still a summer resident there wrote to me and she said, oh, that rock's name is, she told me its name, I can't remember it right now. Um, and I love that the rock has a name. And as I've been doing my research, I've also found out that this rock is known for being a site of magic. The, you know, the hidden people live there. And I would, then I was like, oh, that's what the lights are. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of rocks <laughs> with names and stuff in Scotland as well. I think we have a lot of that in common with, with Iceland this is, for sure. This is one of those rocks where they actually, when they built the road, they went around it. Yeah, very expressly. Awesome. When you look on the map, you're like, oh, that's why there's a funny angle there, because they didn't want to disturb it. If you go to the, uh, go to the south of Iceland at the moment, you'll be able to take pictures with lots of little gold spots like that at the moment with the, the new volcano that's erupting yeah. down there. So you need to venture down there with your Polaroid. 
I have to get down there. It, I unfortunately the volcano decided the first vent decided to open up literally two days after I had just left Reykjavik. Um, I I live about five hundred kilometers north of there, mm -hmm. um, and it's a seven hour drive in winter, yeah. six hour drive in summer. So, um, but it's a volcano. Seven hours. But it's a volcano. <laughs> so uh, I'll get. I have to go down there next month for a meeting. So. Um, I hopefully will get to it and I'll definitely have to take a Polaroid with me. Um, but I guess it's the, it, there's so many vents now and they're the three, lava though. maybe covering up. No, no yeah. there's nine. Oh, there's nine. There, is there? Wow. Yeah. Nine or 10 oh, or something no. like that. And they may, they may cover up the trail. So we'll see if I can get there <laughs> yeah, well, with do, my luck. I'll be too slow. If you do be safe. That's all I only ask oh, this, yes. this next image is a very interesting image because this is probably the most uh it's a pinhole yeah image but normally we think of pinholes as being very simple gear but this was quite, you use quite some quite a lot of technical <laughs> gear for this pinhole well I, I you know you can make a pinhole camera out of an oatmeal box famously yep, or anything. a shoe box or whatever yeah. um my pinhole is a little tiny hole drilled in a cover for a, my Hasselblad um <laughs> Because then you have it with you always, and you don't have to worry about the oatmeal box getting squashed. Um, so anyway, I was determined to try and make some pinholes while I was on my, this was my first trip to Iceland, the same one as those first two pictures. Um, and I had just, I was using a tripod that was new to me, I think, a travel tripod I had bought. And I hadn't, the, the, the adjustment that, keep that moves something from right to left i hadn't tightened down quite properly mm. um so then this is you know has polaroid on the back of the hasselblad and the pinhole on the front and i set it all up and i am set to take pictures and i'm it's it's a good you know three minute exposure or something and i'm suddenly look at it and realize it's moving <laughs> it's because it's slowly turning to one side and i thought oh it's gonna be crap and it turned out to just bring this magic into the hills there that this one was really hard to scan because that there was so little difference in the tones to try and get what you see if your eye on the scan was actually very challenging um but hopefully i got it eventually so uh, you obviously never never use a new tr a new piece of equipment when you need it most, <laughs> but yeah, it, worked out, it worked out pretty good. Well, but also it tells you not to be afraid of mistakes because your mistakes may end up being prettier than what you were going to do to begin with. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was a question. Now, before I ask you this question, there's there's a whole side to, to well, many genres of photography. We enjoy the technique and the taking of image as much as we enjoy the final result, right? And I think, yeah. I think instant film is probably, you know, at the the far end of that scale of people who love the the equipment and the culture that goes a, goes along with, uh, you know, the the taking of the image and it's not just about the 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 end result. I'm trying to find a question that came in earlier. Be with me. Yeah. So Pat asks, and this is a great segue to look at some of the gear you have there. Pat asks, any favorite cameras, older or newer, for Polaroid, or cameras you wish you had. So I know you have a few little things there. This is my favorite. I was saying to Alistair earlier today, why don't they make things this pretty anymore? I mean, who, why, you know, you know why make things out of plastic when you can make it out of chrome and fake leather? leather? Um, that's your, that's mine the has, SX70, mine has right? little dots of cyanotype solution on it because I was careless in the dark room. Mm -hmm. Oops. So that's the SX70, or it's a beautiful. This is the SX70, which is just a beautiful piece of, of it's just a beautiful object. Yep. You could sit this, you know, except that it would get dusty and you wouldn't want that. You could just live, leave it sitting like this on your shelf and it's just a beautiful thing. Yeah, and it so. works wonderfully. The lens on this thing makes gorgeous. Um, funny little star shaped light dots like you know when when things are out of focus it makes a very distinctive sort of star shape um a lot of control on this really good lens love this thing takes it, the film that uses is slow so it's not great in super low light so i haven't been using this thing all winter because it's been too dark here 
um, when it's dark, I use my, oh, sorry about the noise, okay. S SLR 680, which opens up the same way and looks almost exactly the same when they're open, except that it's, it's demure in its black outfit. <laughs> um, this Rest also is nice because it has um, auto focus on it with this thing somehow. I don't quite know how it works, but um, I'm getting older and my eyes are crappy, especially when it comes to close up vision. I can't see without these glasses. Um, so, auto focus, very handy. Mm. Um, and my last show and tell camera is a land camera. I actually have two of these. This is my 180, it has a better lens and more controls for f-stop and things on it. And one of the fun things about shooting, if you can get it to open, there we go. Um, when you're shooting with Polaroids is people stop and look at you funny. <laughs> Cause like, <laughs> what is that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm but sure that- But that's people... part of the thrill, right? Engaging with it people is. when you're doing your creative outlet and you know people being interested in the gear can lead to some incredible conversations uh, absolutely and, and one of the like um i was hiking in colorado a couple of summers ago um i'm doing before i was doing this iceland research project i just started a research project in colorado which has now been abandoned for the time being but i had my sx70 was shooting some pictures with it and a couple came hiking by um and they asked me about the camera and they're like, oh, wow, is that a Polaroid? And oh, wow, you know, long conversation about it. Um, and they said, hey, would you be willing to take a picture of us? Um, and I was like, sure, of course, if you would send, if you will just take a picture of it when you get home and send it to me, just so I have a weird geeky thing, just have a record of what I did. Um, and they did. So I, you know, took, gave them the, Polaroid, and um, a day later, they sent me a scan of it. That's nice, and it was That's a very cool. nice one. Yeah, there's uh, there's a there's a lot of love for your SX70 in the, in the channel. People yeah. are swinging, swinging over it, literally. It is. Is, that, it's is that your beautiful. favorite? Do you have a it favorite? Is, is that it? Yeah. Um, I for my Polaroids, yeah, I think this is my favorite. Yeah. Although I like using pack film more than instant self-developing films. So in that sense, maybe the land cameras are my favorites, but this one just as a, as a piece of our material culture, it's just such a cool thing. Um, they should start making them like this again. It would look lovely on my shelf right there. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're watching this and you're, you know, there's many of you in the, in the chat there that I know are Polaroid photographers, instant film users. What's your favorite camera? What camera do you own? What's your favorite? Which one do you wish you owned? Uh, mm -hmm. Get in the chat window and let us let us know, and we'll we'll have a little shout out in the last five minutes of your your favorite cameras. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the group before we finish up. Um, yes, there's currently 340 members in this year's uh, Polaroid Week Flickr group. Uh, and already over the last, well, this is this is day five, right? So- Yeah, 12, we only 12, have one day left, but there's yeah, one day left. You could get 1200, in on 1,200 images already um, in, in the group, and there's some beautiful stuff. I'm loving this new uh, thing that we're seeing- Round frame. Uh, round frame uh, instant film. Have you, have you shot with this yourself? I haven't actually, um, in part because we were, and we just had a discussion about this. You know, one of the wonderful things about Polaroid Week is we, like I said, we get to get together twice a year to do this. Um, and people are allowed to post two pictures a day, mm -hmm. no more. Um, they have to be work that's new this week. You don't have to have made it this week. That's too restrictive because people might not have time yeah. or the weather might be horrible or whatever. Um, but there has to be something you haven't shown publicly before. Yeah. Um, so I spent a lot of my time kicking out stuff that was uploaded five years ago. Yeah. And people are just trying to get more likes or whatever. But a um, new piece of work. Exactly. Um, a new piece to the, to the rest of us, at least. Um, and then we also have some discussion threads. So we have, you know, there's one of the things I really love about Polaroid Week is the chance to celebrate other people's work. Hey, there's mine. <laughs> um, the, the greeny one. Um, so we have favorites from each day and people 
don't post their own work. They post other people's work yep. saying, oh my God, look at this. It's so incredible. And we also have some discussion threads that are just like, so what's happening? What's, you know, what are people into? Or look here, all the cats that people posted, instant cats. This, because there always seem to be a lot of, of, of course, cats. cats yeah. Um, yeah. And that's happening and, in, the, in the discussion section of the Flickr group. Yes, there are um, these uh, sticky discussions that are going on about the favorites uh, from, from the last five days. But you see, so the rule is you're not allowed to post your own. It has to be someone, so a favorite. Yeah, you, you it's found. Not, I don't think it's actually a rule. It's just the way things Unwritten have worked. Because it really is about celebrating other people's work. Um, and there's a thing. Uh, uh, Patrick put up a um, thread there called frames to show or not. And we had sort of a conversation. Do you, yeah. do you scan it with the frame? Do you scan it without? I'm one of those scan without people. Mm -hmm. I, back in the day when I was first starting to do this, I, I decided I wanted the image to stand kind of on its own and not lean too hard on the fact that it was a Polaroid. Um, Cause sometimes you just see the Polaroid, oh, it's a Polaroid. And it, you're not even looking at the image itself as much as the mm -hmm. object. Um, but a lot of other people scan the frames and so on. And so I never bought round frame film because I would just- Crop it. Then I'd have to, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what I would, how I would do with that. Because obviously like then the frame is... Look, we're, yeah. in, we're in round frames. Look, we're in round frames. Yeah. How perfect. And, and hey, look, there's me. There's me in the discussions right there. I'm there you are. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I would... The, the cool cat's thread is down there. <laughs> yeah, I would encourage anybody to go get involved in the discussions. You're obviously posting your image uh, to the group is, you know a huge part right that's what you know it's all yeah. about is seeing these incredible images that every time i refresh this page there's there's new images there so uh go post images and there's but, such good work people just do amazing stuff yeah. and such a huge variety all different kinds of film all different kinds of cameras all parts of the world um yeah, it's really involved wonderful in the discussions the discussions are such a fun part of, of what we yeah did. i love this i love triptychs i love when people you know, really, uh, take, Ines you know, the queen of the, and... the forest triptych. She yeah. just knocks them out of the park every time. <laughs> I, I do love that. So I'd encourage everybody to go over there. People are posting their favorite cameras. Let's go over and see, oh, uh, Ina says S X 70. That's her yeah. favorite. Miriam says, I've fallen in love with so many photos people have taken <laughs> on the S X 70 this week. I think I mean, not be very long before I have to buy myself one. How um, good investment? Yeah, the lot. <laughs> everybody's mentioned S six seventy. Sarah's going to buy them all. The, the there you go. The six seventy, um, or, or has the or has them all. Um, <laughs> Claudia, S six seventy again. Yeah. It's a piece of art in its own right. It's so true, and and you know, it's there's no Look denying. That is. Uh, Nick says he has so many favorite cameras, but I use my Polaroid <laughs> one nine five the, mo the most yeah. recently. Um, another sh Hillary's got SX seventy and the Land camera, uh, so yeah, lots of lots of SX. Yeah, my for a long time I shot with a Land camera two fifty, an automatic two fifty, um, which doesn't have a lot of controls on it, and the lens is not as good as the one eighty. So they are even the Land cameras. There's quite a lot of difference between them. It's been interesting to shoot with a new one, new to me, in sort of those last days of of pack film. Sarah, you already own them all. That's awesome. Yeah, she's got them all. How how easy is it to get? Uh, an Does she SX have a 70? 24 by 30, whatever that huge <laughs> giant one is? That's what I want, man. That's what you want? <laughs> yeah. How, how easy is it to get something like an SX-70? Do you know these days? I have no idea. Um, almost the 180 that I got recently was basically put in a box with a whole bunch of pack film that I was buying from mm. a former TIP employee. I'm blanking on his name. Um, it was very kind to just say, hey, do you want this? I don't, he didn't feel like he was going to have any yeah. use for it anymore. Um, but I, so I haven't bought a Polaroid camera probably since 2008, something like that. I don't know. I'm a little out of touch. Yeah, They're probably yeah, expensive, right. expensive now. <laughs> <laughs> probably. Well, they are now, now that we've been telling everybody how good they are. Exactly. <laughs> the, um, you and your professional life, um, you know, have, have done a lot of great work. You've even written your own book. And mm -hmm. although it's not about photography, it's about it's your, your uh, well, this was a science that you work in. Yeah, this was a, this is my book. It's called The Paradox of Preservation. 
wilderness and working landscapes at Point Reyes National Seashore. Um, being a good Northern Californian, had to write about a Northern Californian place. Um, and it has nothing to do with pictures, except that I took all the pictures in the book, except for the historical photographs that are in it. There's a few, um, including all the ones on the cover. It's rare that you get to actually contribute to your own book cover. Mm -hmm. um, but more importantly to this story, the frontest pieces of each chapter are, sorry, I don't know how to hold this, um, are Polaroids, Polaroids. Um, taken with chocolate film, uh, one of the, which is my favorite film. If you're gonna talk about favorite cameras, you have to talk about favorite film too. And 669 is up there, but chocolate wins for me. It was so wonderful. And um, this was one of the kinds of pack film where when Polaroid you know, went bankrupt, they destroyed the machines to make it. And it seemed like an interesting analogy to some of the stuff that was happening to the working landscape, the sort of cultural human history of Point Reyes as it was managed as a park um, that, was, that I was seeing in my work. And so I ended up taking a lot of pictures in Point Reyes with my automatic 250 and the chocolate film and used them to um, preface each, each chapter. So, and I think in the set that, um, that you have, there of my photos there's a bunch of them in there too so anyway um it was a really nice way to bring for someone who's a geeky academic like me to bring my geeky photo obsession together with my geeky academic you know it's just get, like yeah. geek times get your too. obsession into um, your professional world that's the yeah it was really nice to bring your hobby together with your professional life um and who knows maybe one of these days they'll swap mm. <laughs> that'd be fun that would be. Uh, so how long are you planning on being in Iceland for? I am definitely here through September because, um, I, like I said, I'm on this Fulbright grant that runs until the end of August. Um, my university back in California is going through some financial troubles right now, as many are post-COVID, mm -hmm. in the middle of COVID still. Um, and they recently put up a thing saying, hey, if anybody wants to retire early, so I'm actually thinking of doing that. And, and retiring and, and staying in Iceland? I'm going to try. Um, it's really hard to get residency permission as someone from a non-EU or EEA country. Yeah. Um, but um, the stuff I do, both environmental history and a lot of um, sort of heritage related um, analysis is a um, hot topic here. There's a lot of conversations about creating national parks. That's my expertise. Yeah. So I'm hoping, I just sent in my paperwork to get an extended residency permit and we'll see if I can stay longer because I love it here. Yeah. I just love it here. Well, hopefully they create And it doesn't parks. catch on fire the way, uh, yeah. it doesn't catch on fire the way Sonoma keeps doing. Hopefully they create national parks so that they don't uh, damn them to create energy sources, which is I know, a yeah. big issue in Iceland. But I hear getting residency in Iceland is much easier if you adopt cats while you're there. <laughs> well, I'm I'm guaranteed then I've got two very cute ones who are still asleep <laughs> in a pile. They're brothers and they love each other and they sleep with their paws wrapped around each other. Halfway and of day, course, I have cats. taken Polaroids of them. <laughs> <laughs> have, they, have, have you submitted them for the Polaroid week? Not yet. I might no. tomorrow. I haven't decided, but I'm going to post tomorrow yet. No. We'll watch Maybe the space. The watch the watch space. space. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Laura, thank you so much for the moment. For those of you that have been watching, thank you so much for the all the conversation in the chat in there. I'm going to ask you a huge favor hit that subscribe button, hit that bell notification. That way you'll be notified whenever we have another episode here on Smug Mug Live. We typically live stream on a Tuesday and a Thursday, uh, assuming we don't have any huge outages like we did have this Tuesday and I wasn't able to live stream. It wasn't <laughs> our fault. It was the some other service that connects YouTube and all the live streamers together. So we were a bit scuppered on Tuesday. So apologies for MD that... Uh, was expecting a show on Tuesday. We weren't able to, to live stream. But uh, Laura, thank you so much. I've put all the details, not only to Polaroid Week Flickr group, but also to all your uh, links for your website and your social channels right oh, here in the description of the show. I would really encourage everybody to go show Laura some love on her images. <laughs> and of course, join the Polaroid Flickr group and, yes. you know, get get obsessed um, like everybody else. Join us. Yeah. And bring it's your, your own SX70. Yeah, yeah. Bring your credit card. Get into the, the, the <laughs> hobby that 
truly costs money uh but no it's it's a, a lot of fun and it's been a fantastic week looking at all the incredible images that have have come in this week but they're always coming to Flickr. we've seen a lot of them uh, make it to the explore pages this week on uh, on Flickr as well so really wonderful to see that congratulations to everybody involved in polaroid week all the admins over there on the group thank you for all the work you do yes, yes. all the admins i'm one of a team mm -hmm. um this is definitely not just me and um i speak for all of us when i say just um it's so much fun it's a uh, labor of love and um, love, absolutely love working with the rest of the folks who are admins and all the people who participate. Yeah. Well, thank you, Laura, so much for your time. Uh, I wish you I could uh, jump on a plane and come join you in Iceland for a little bit, which yeah, maybe maybe so, soon you can. It's only forty minutes away, so maybe maybe yeah. very soon. But uh, you can swim. Stay safe uh, wherever you are in the world, folks. As always, stay safe, be kind, look after each other. And we'll see you back here for another episode of Smug Mug Live very soon. Laura, thank you again so much. Take care. Take care. Bye.